Brethren, it, it is indeed good to stand before you today. Um, I'm only here because of the goodness and mercy of our great Lord and Savior and God. So I thank the Lord for this time in which I can testify of his mercy and grace. He who hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Yesterday I was encouraged by Sister Rosalind. I, I don't see her. Um, she gave her testimony and I was encouraged by that. So this is my testimony. And I'll just give a few words about where I've come from. Now I realize that I'm speaking to many of you, all of you, who have a zeal for God according to knowledge. And we fervently desire this for, for the hearts of all men. But in the economy of faith in the neighborhood in which I was raised, the nature of my upbringing was considered quite normal. At home, my brothers and I were not brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Although neither were we provoked to wrath, as children, my mother and I said the Lord's Prayer each night before we went to sleep. In public elementary school, we sang a stirring hymn in the morning assembly. In public high school, the education authorities had a measure of enlightenment still, and we had a divinity class. It was mandatory for the first year. This was a class to study the Bible, academic class taught just like chemistry or mathematics. As a young boy in church, I learned of a God, of love and a man called Jesus, born in Bethlehem in a manger at Christmas, who performed miracles and who was cruelly treated, then nailed to a cross without a city wall, and died in unspeakable agony on Easter and came back to life, but I wasn't sure why. As a youngster, these curious events in the Bible held significance to me because lots of bank holidays and vacations seemed to line up with them. However, in actuality, God was placing in my heart remembrance of these things for a later season. I remember singing hymns about being made free by a Savior who would come with healing in his wings. And I remember a regular diet of God's Ten Commandments and warnings of a fiery end awaiting those who sinned but church soon became optional for me, and I stopped attending. I was lured by things of the world that demanded my time. The first Bible God ever sent to me was a pocket-sized Gideon's Bible that I received in high school. I have it to this day, and it is with me whenever I travel. Beginning in my teen years, I had close friends who were witnesses for Christ, but whom, it seemed to me, did not lead very exciting lives. Still, God had told me in a small measure about himself, but I dwelt in the midst of a rebellious house which have no eyes to see and see not, and they have ears to hear and hear not. But in my college dorm room, I had pinned to the corkboard this three by five card. On here are the words of Revelation 21 verse four. I memorized and found solace in Psalm 23 and John 3:16. So as the Hebrews had a shadow of good things to come in the law, I see now the Lord had given me in my youth a small measure of the knowledge of him and his son, but still I was akin, akin to the condition of the Israelites to whom God said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouths and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. For three years I trained in sciences in geology. Grievously, I had no patience for those who claimed God made in six days the heavens and the earth. Highly unlikely, I would say. For many years, God allowed Satan to direct my steps, and I conducted my life according to all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Words I had never even heard of. But the Lord had not yet convicted me that I needed him. And I, ignorant and unheeding of his word like many before me, sat in darkness, dead in trespass and sins, walked according to the course of this world. I was bound, a captive in prison. Brethren, I had heard the word of God, but hadn't received it, 
and believed it in my heart. How many are those who have heard his word yet still have not believed? Here I'd like to briefly relate an incident that contributed greatly to the lifeless path I was on before the Lord, by grace, called me to his Christ. It is a cautionary tale to young people and not so young people. It tells of the craftiness of Satan and his persuasion that we will profit most by being in the world. A very dangerous delusion to those young in the faith and those of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. It serves as a reminder of Paul's warning to the, Colossi Colossi to the Colossians, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. During the early years of my professional career, you see, I was persuaded that in order to be more effective and successful, it would be advantageous for me to write down a personal mission statement and some short and long-term personal goals. Some of you may have done the same. Brethren, of 18 such goals that I came up with, all vainglorious and perfectly admirable to the world, not a single one had mention or a shadow of our great God or Christ. Not a one recognized my need for a savior, my true station as a servant of God, his great love, mercy, and grace, aspirations to attain unto the character and likeness of Christ, acknowledgement that today and tomorrow are gifts, not mine to invent, that my life is not my own. I was very far from God. In our culture, the world constantly enjoins us to plan for our earthly success and our life ahead, as if we alone, through our strength, hold the keys to our future. I know now God's primary concern for us is not our earthly comfort or worldly success. He cares infinitely more how we prepare for and comport ourselves in the kingdom of heaven. We are mistaken if we think God's will for us allows for personal goals that do not include and glorify him. We do everything according to his will to please him and glorify his name. Back then, without knowledge of God, I couldn't have known that his will for me is that I do his will. As it is written, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Without my faith in a living God and acknowledgement of his supremacy in heaven and earth, the tempter had, without any hindrance, persuaded me things of the world and its associations are to be embraced. Even that such things are to be sought above all else. I had ignored the words of Christ, thou shalt, have, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Even so, God in his mercy kept me from moral degeneracy. He kept me from falling seriously afoul of man's laws and any grave worldly dangers. Now I see that in these seasons past, God had purposed that I should not yet know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. That he had been preparing me for an appointment that would come according to his schedule. God also, by his mercy, accorded to me a measure of success toward many of those worldly goals. But along the way, I'd set up false idols, surely displeasing God. I placed personal success ahead of his will. Love of things above love of others, I'd placed worldly lusts and pride ahead of truth and humility, all the time oblivious to our Savior's words. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. I had become so earthly minded, I was no heavenly good, and the level of my earthly fitness was exceeded only by that of the prominence of the false idols in my life. My soul was, if not lost, in great jeopardy. And the Lord's own words would soon convict me. The appointed day of my chastening came in 2012. On the day before my 34th wedding anniversary, I was at home washing my car in the driveway. It was a sun, sunny end of summer day. 
and a stranger with a step full of purpose walked up the driveway and handed me a brown envelope. Inside was a lawsuit for a divorce. That same afternoon, I learned that Cindy, my wife of 34 years, had left and would not be coming back. Satan had driven us apart, and I was complicit. You could say that is when God's hammer fell. As it is written, it is not my, it is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. In an instant, I realized everything that I had achieved, in truth, what God had allowed me to achieve, meant nothing. This was abject failure of a kind I had never known. I didn't know what I had done wrong. But I now know I was asking the wrong question. Jeremiah prayed, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And Paul told the Corinthians, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? And ye are not your own, for you are bought with a price. My question should not have been what have I done with my life, but what have I failed to do with the life the Lord had entrusted to me. He had manifested to me that I'd failed to keep not only his greatest commandment to love him, but also his first commandment to his people. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Nothing man could offer would fix this broken condition. It required something much higher and greater than human strength. It was too grievous to be otherwise. And on that day, the Lord called me to his son and said, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brethren, quickly, blessed things started to happen, all arranged, even prearranged by God. He led me to know that a number of my friends were believers and were able, they were able to minister to me. Another good friend invited me to join him at fellowship at the church he attended with his wife. And for the first time in over 40 years, God led me to regularly attend worship service. He removed hindrances that had prevented Cindy and I from communicating. And we met briefly. And he blessed us by giving us to see that we each still had deep, heartfelt feelings for one another. God led us each to move to Joplin to be with our Christian children and grandchildren, greatly blessing us. Through our daughter, the Lord led us to her church assembly to worship and study his word. Cindy accepted Christ into her life and was baptized. God led us both on a path to healing and reconciliation. And we talked about reuniting in a life with our growing love for God and Christ at its center. In May of 2014, after much prayer and by, God, by God's great goodness and mercy, Cindy and I were remarried in the presence of God before the gathering of the saints. And Cindy is here today. And I thank God for her heart of compassion and her love for the Lord. Brethren, this is something that only God could have done. He knew how imperfect I am, but through his infinite mercy and goodness, he brought me up out of that miry clay. Daily, he shows his great love and mercy toward us. He has showered us with gifts, and by Christ's strength, I've cast out many former idols, heeding Jonah's words and his prayer to God. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. And the Lord's words to Habakkuk, what profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it, a metal image, a teacher of lies, for its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Brethren, mine is a work in progress though, as I confess, there are many idols that I haven't completely destroyed. For almost three years, I attended with my family the assembly where Cindy and I were remarried, but I had a growing unease and sensed a non-spiritual of this world undertone in the teaching and the praise and worship that did not sit well with my soul and which did not satisfy the hunger for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. I had awakened to the reality that the world had crept into Christian worship, and in the minds of many, platitudes invented by men had been elevated to spiritual prominence. Words such as let go and let God 
something the Bible nowhere tells us to do. It's the title of a book authored 65 years ago by a leader in the New Thought Movement. Search can minister to us, but let us proclaim our true guide to be the only book with the eternal words of truth. Amen. Brethren, in Christ, you see, we do not cease from striving, as some might believe. Rather, we are to earnestly contend for the faith which is once delivered unto the saints. We strive to enter in at the straight gate, continually fighting the good fight of faith and laboring for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life as yoke fellows together with Christ. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy wrought with labor and travail night and day so as not to be a burden to the saints. The saints wrestle against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Brethren, may we vehemently seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And in our majestic and enduring hymns, written only four centuries ago, we proclaim to our Lord that we are soldiers of Christ, pressing the battle, that we are taking on the panoply of God to arm us for the fight where the battle fierce is raging in fields of conquest. And the Lord calls us into works that require our might to do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, and with diligent effort without murmurings and disputings. And in case there is still any doubt, consider Paul's words to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Brethren, there is work to be done, but oh, consider the rewards that await us. So in early 2016, God led me through Brother Jim Moss from a parched land to the word of truth. And I knew this humble assembly of brothers and sisters with tender hearts and a fervent desire for the true bread of life and a quest for heaven was exactly where God had planned for me to be. I praise God for this light and the darkness. Amen. And on July the 2nd of this year, God called me to obedience and I answered his call to be baptized into Christ and raised to walk in newness of life and quickened by God's spirit. Brethren, I am blessed to be among the family of the saints who fight the good fight of faith, laying hold on eternal life whereunto we've been called and hath professed a good profession before many witnesses. And every day I purpose now with the saints to press toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It is written that we once were not a people and had not obtained mercy, but now through Christ we have obtained mercy. And I praise and give thanks to God who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, he who has passed us from death unto life. In times past, Isaiah spoke to the, of the Israelites, we wait for light, but behold obscurity, for brightness, but we walk in darkness. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are, des we are in desolate places as dead men. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation, but it is far from us. But brethren, now we see we are light in the Lord. We're commanded to walk as children of light. We no longer stumble as it is written, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. We are now saved for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And we are seated together with Christ in heavenly places. Praise God. We testify that when our love for God is above all else, we can speak from the heart and without hesitation proclaim, Lord, I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Sometimes I'm tempted to feel regret that I had not come to Christ early in my childhood. Look at what I'd been missing out on. But this is incorrect thinking and presumes to challenge God's omniscience. See, it is not in our power to justify our past because we neither created it nor possessed it. And God's plan for our lives is not that we are to purpose to establish our own future because he possesses it and it's already been established in heaven. As Paul told us, I hath not seen 
nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So rather we ask him to, re to reveal his future for us. As David wrote, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit, by, commit thy way unto the Lord and trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Also trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That's, of course, in Proverbs. So God allowed me 60 years before he taught me it is unwise to spurn his word and his gift of salvation. And now every day I praise and thank him for bringing me to him through his son, Jesus Christ. Brethren, God's desire for our lives on earth is that we will be a glory to him. And when we're raised up on that final day, he will receive utmost glory. And on that future day, when we shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, we shall begin the best and greatest part of our life everlasting with him in heaven. Brothers, this is the future he has in store for us. And what of those personal goals? Well, I no longer hold any affection at all for this worldly term or the commonly held thesis behind it. They have no meaning in the kingdom of heaven where Christ rules at the right hand of God and we submit to him. We who believe have desires of the heart which come from knowing God and Christ. They concern the things of eternal life, fruits of the spirit, love of the brethren, growing in the body of Christ, pleasing God. Brother Gibbon, on the occasion of a business interview, once said, my words may not be exact here, that his most important short-term goal for his earthly life was to finish each day without displeasing God. His long-term goal was to string as many of those days together as he could. Amen to that, and surely this is the desire that every one of us wants to have. So the Lord has put his laws into our hearts and written them in our minds. And we purpose for our desires to be in perfect alignment with the Father's will, the which is fully to be found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. And we gladly affirm for his sake, he must increase, but I must decrease. In 1878, the hymnist wrote, breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until with thee I will one will to do and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine, until this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. Breathe on me, breath of God, so shall I never die, but live with thee the perfect life of thine eternity. Brethren, in closing, may we ever remember Jude's words to the saints. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life.